We good? Yeah, these last few months have been tough. I think it was a lot more difficult than any of us thought it was gonna be. Well, I think the most frustrating thing about the pandemic was uh, the way that essentially the lower income bracket of society gets forgotten. I was thinking about the ramifications of working with the young people and the families that we do. The challenge is keeping ministry going. We're just contacting youth and making sure they were okay. Watching them become distant and sad and lonely. And there was nothing I could do to fix that. Um, we had so many plans of how we were gonna Run that summer, we had been meeting on, I was gonna run the paintball program and suddenly we were not doing what we had been planning. I did question whether this ministry was viable, whether, whether it would happen. It's been hard to feel like I'm doing what I am called to do. You know, it's divided so many people and brought so many frustrations and tears to people. Um, yeah, it's it's a mystery. It's it's painful. So, yeah. Um, the lockdowns, the restrictions just seemed like it was never going to end, really. And then slowly we started to see things kind of open up a little bit and and the new, new opportunities started to present themselves, which was, which was pretty cool. For the first time in a long time, we were able to run summer programming and have some summer students. So yeah, that was encouraging. I was thinking about the ramifications of working with the young people and the families that we do. Hardest thing about doing this ministry is uh, work is working with the people. Our, our kids are mostly in our city, in this neighborhood, and in this, and it's uh, difficult. Some difficult family situations, and getting to know the kids a little bit better, you understand those those um, family situations. It was important for us to offer summer programming because there's just often not a lot going on for kids in the summer. Uh, programs end at the end of June and there's just nothing for them to do. So they're, you know, hanging out at home in their basements, just playing video games or getting into stuff that they shouldn't be getting into. So being able to offer summer programming gives them a different opportunity. Well, how I got in connection with YFC was actually through my church. Um, their partnership with Carpenters Church uh, introduced me to everybody, and I got the opportunity to work with YFC as a summer student 
along with working for the kids ministry at my church. Uh, the pandemic has affected me and my friends in a lot of different ways. Um, it became a lot easier to grow apart rather than to grow together because we weren't allowed to see each other. It was very isolating. Um, Self-isolation was horrible. Uh, I lost a lot of really good friends and it also showed me who my closest friends were because they were the ones who stuck with me and helped me through a lot of hard times because the pandemic has affected our mental health a lot too. Cool. This is a good little thing. Yeah, just wrap it on there. And tie it there. Yeah, just tie it there. Tie a knot. It works. And Troy is prepared. Uh, that's, <laughs> the eye crutches in the trunk. Oh, he's starting early. Oh, my uh -oh, goodness. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Come on, Garrett, go get her. It's important to offer summer programming uh, because lots of the kids we work with, home isn't a safe place. Um, home isn't an inviting place. And I think that's, for me, it's, less, it's really sad. It's a, it's a place where there's ugliness, there's alcohol, drug abuse, um, and just physical and emotional abuse in general. Not for all of them, but for a lot of them it is. And then at the same time too, so many of the kids, um, they, they, they'll be out to all hours of the night. So you're working with, with families that have just so much dysfunction and dysfunction that like plays out in some really odd, odd ways. You know, it's divided so many people and brought so many frustrations and tears to people. Um, but what happened is that it seemed as if the relationships that I had developed with a bunch of the teenagers here in Mormon, um, it's like they wanted to avoid me. Uh, I think they all got into uh, drugs and alcohol and they wanted to hide from me and not let me know that they were doing this stuff. And it seemed like the dynamic and the energy at the park became very, very dark. So the hardest thing about the pandemic for me in the zone was watching the kids slide into isolation and um, watching them become distant and sad and lonely. And there was nothing I could do to fix that. Well, I think the most frustrating thing about the pandemic was uh, the way that essentially the lower income bracket of society gets forgotten. I know for a fact that our kids would be in way worse places if it wasn't for our program. I, I know over the years, um, some of the decisions that these kids have made, even with our guidance, have been bad. And the influences that they have in their life, if we're not there, they're making way worse decisions and way worse friends. Deacon's sister moved to the res. Arabella? I was like, you coming tonight? She's like, no, I moved. We literally saw you last week. I've realized with kids that um, if they almost like stick their, if they're a little nervous about coming and they like st uh, put themselves out there, like they make the phone call, which can be pretty intimidating, which I understand is more of a, uh, uh, a, a more recent occurrence. Um, so if a kid like gets the works up the courage to like make that phone call and I don't answer, then they're like, well, I'm well, I'm just I'm just gonna give up. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a phone call. It's like this is not gonna happen. And uh, things about uh, abuse, poverty, uh, they tend to cycle. And if you grow up in a home that is broken, you will tend to be create a home that will be broken. And uh, what we try to help and offer offer these kids is the ability to break that cycle of poverty and abuse um, where to, where they can live a life where they don't need substances, they don't need pot, they don't need alcohol, they don't uh, need other forms of um, substances that help dull the pain.
You want to get it? With COVID happening and the way that it all came about, I did question whether this ministry was viable, whether, whether it would happen. Um, I was still, like as far as ministry-wise, I was still waiting on insurance and some other things, so it didn't directly affect like my program immediately. But then, you know, as, as it kind of dragged on, it was difficult working from home all the time, and I was fairly new on staff at that point. And so, like, not being able to be in the office at all or with my other team members um, was a little bit difficult because, you know, I just missed that camaraderie that I was just starting to get. This is fun, too. This is fun, too. Aww. It's been hard uh, being kind of new to YFC and we started the Stepping Stones program back last September and just the moms just weren't coming. Um, it was hard to make connections with young moms. They're, they've got some pretty significant walls built up and um, yeah, they're not not necessarily as keen on going somewhere where they don't know the place and they don't know the people there. Okay, so what you're gonna do? I think we're all discouraged to a point, but we also spent the time praying for those who would show up in the future, and um, I think that was really valuable too. Um, it was more just discouraging that people, that there's this program that could be helpful and encouraging, and we just know that people would benefit from it, and so that was discouraging that other that, but there is a fear of going to a new program, and so there is understanding in that in discouragement, I guess. But I think the main thing that I was thinking when lockdowns happened was just wanting to protect people. Um, I felt it was more important for me to isolate myself uh, from my family and friends um, because of that. Um, and I live alone, so it was really hard on my mental health to uh, five days a week be completely isolated by myself. Definitely had moments of deep sadness because originally we kind of thought it was just going to last for a couple of weeks, that it was just going to be like two weeks or a month of lockdown. And then after a couple months of not seeing my family, it was just, it was very emotionally draining. With this group, just so that we're a little bit more even. And Kiara, I kind of showed how to play this game earlier. So if you want, we can scoop back up and I will get you the solarium. It was incredibly difficult to be by myself a lot and really lonely. Honestly, some of the challenges keeping ministry going were just contacting youth and making sure they were okay. I I remember just not getting messages back from students right away and yeah after a couple of days of students not messaging you back you were just hoping that they were okay because it was just this deep sense of loneliness this like heartache that you could tell they were going through but you couldn't like help them and then my uh, self-esteem went down quite a bit after that but it's better now and then also just being sad that you can't go out and stuff, you can't see your family. It just changed like everyone's life really quickly within like months and months. I think another struggle in ministry is seeing students go through the same thing that you've been through. Cause like, I mean, I'm lonely all the time too. And, and I see my students struggle with being lonely. Struggle with singleness, struggle with this idea of living life on their own. And 
I have a burden for them because I, I totally know what they're going through. Um, I put this because it looks like it would be like traveling to a big city. I want to be not here. <laughs> I want to be anywhere but here traveling. And then this is kind of like a party. I want to go to parties, like gatherings. I, I want to go to a wedding dance so badly, so badly. And this is what it would be like. This one, because single life sucks. <laughs> So I have these two boys who, and this has happened several times now, but you know, they meet at our program. They hang out every week for three or four years. They don't go to the same school. These two boys, really great kids. They get to hang out all the time. COVID happens and the way the schools work, you're divided up into two different cohorts. And so these two kids, though best friends, got split up. And so the kid that was in the latter group, he befriended this new group of kids. One night, after I'd spent a good three or four hours at the Saskatoon Skateboard Park, skateboarding with students, I came home, I had supper, and I felt like the Lord was saying, go to the Warman Park. And so even though I was sore and tired, I went and I skateboarded, and then one of these students, one of these young guys who had kind of avoided me all summer, rolled up to me, sat beside me, and started to tell me all about the bad path that he was on. Told me about everything. And uh, it was fascinating, because I was only there for about a half an hour and then this happened. Um, and it was obvious that God had ordained this and made it come together. And so we had time to chat and to counsel, and I just had time to encourage him. And then towards the end of this conversation, he got a call. And it was not a good call. It was a reason to pray. The role I play in the lives of the kids that I work with is to be a mentor, to be an example, um, to walk with them and, and just lead them to a better life. These kids at home have a very interesting life. They're either they might be living with a mother, grandmother, aunt. There's hardly any two-parent homes of the kids that we work with. There's um, food insecurities. There's drugs and gang violence and some gangs are even prevalent in the homes. Yeah. It's hard to see them go through some of the stuff they go through and just keep praying and keep relying on God and with his help, we can make a lot of difference or a difference in the lives of some of these kids, hopefully all of the kids. I think some of the challenges that I faced when I was growing up was uh, not having a father in my life. There's definitely something missing when, when one of your parents is not in the picture. I feel like um, the way that my own childhood helps with the ministry I'm involved with, with Stepping Stones, is I anticipate that a lot of the young women that come to us will be single parents. Um, they'll be raising their kid or their kids on their own, uh, hopefully with the support of family. Um, we want to be there to support them too, but um, yeah, I just, I saw, I guess, a different perspective growing up of what it looked like um, to be a single parent. And now again, as an adult, I'm seeing in other people just the, the different perspective of what being a single parent looks like and just understanding that it's really, really hard. Um, 
not having that, that partner supporting you and helping you. So the backgrounds uh, of the people that come here and their home situations, it really varies a lot. Um, single families, two parent families, all, all of it, it's just kind of been a mix. I have, you know, I have people that have learning disabilities or um, like ADHD and fetal alcohol syndrome and different things like that. And, um, you know, they, sometimes their home lives are a little bit difficult. And so, yeah, it's just, this is just a safe place for them to come. Okay, see, I adopted him when he was, uh, it, the adoption went through when he was five and I started, um, taking care of him like when he was three and so I just would bring him to my house when I wasn't working anytime I had days off more than two days off in a row I'd bring him to my house and then this friend of mine just had this horse and I, I'm not sure how we just I, I maybe she mentioned it like and she said you know that, like try it see see how he reacts on the horse and I was just shocked um before I was a lot I had some anger and through school and through everything that would go that would be happening with bullying, anti-bullying and things like that was just in general with life like that. And when I come when I come here it's just relaxing and it's kinda of cleansing if you think about it. Yeah. I approach him. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, you, f you feel that, uh, that bond connection, connection with it, and with, with horses as well. I find a lot more because um, with Native history as well, because I am, I am part Native, with my Native culture, Cree. So I find it more, more relaxing, and I feel more one with, with the horses, with the horses, especially this one. So this yeah. has been like a, a blessing to your family. Oh, definitely, definitely. Very good thing. Very positive thing for Ryan. Yeah. Hopefully it won't be too windy there. And so the kid that was in the latter group, he befriended this new group of kids. If we're running our program, he's with us, but that particular night, he's with this new group of friends. And someone somehow got a ton of alcohol and they all got drunk together and then they decided it would be a good idea to go walking around with machetes in their hands and long story short uh, that kid is now locked up for well I think he he might get out in January to open custody but then he's still in custody for another six months and it was all because he was hanging out with a different group of friends what would happen if the league didn't exist? Uh, well, every kid you see behind me would basically just be hanging out at home or on the street. Um, we've seen from a lot of kids they get pulled from difficult times, difficult circumstances, and they would be right back in it. There would be a lot less hope in their lives, maybe no hope at all. And this gives them a chance to be able to build community, build friendship, and have a team and be proud of a symbol that's on the front of their chest and, and play as one. So if, if we're running our program that night, he's with me. Running our program that night, he's playing goalie for Mitch. He's got goalie pads on. He's playing it. Um, if you weren't coming to hockey, what would you be doing right now? Uh, I would be at home or walking around somewhere. But I know, I know that I'm I'm not mad at them. I like I, I know in the back of my head I'm I'm maybe frustrated with them, but I'm I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at the situation. It made the kid be in this situation where they're, I guess, being annoying or frustrating or aggravating or whatever. I'm mad at a parent until I realized that that parent's a residential school survivor. How can I be mad at that? Yeah, it's tough to, to remain not getting mad at, at families because they're not taking care of their kids or whatever else. I think the hardest part is to see them not have enough food, you know, and um, to reach out to them and make sure that we get in touch with them. 
Also, um, we've had some kids, all of a sudden, they got evicted from their house and then they ended up living in three different hotels at a time or another so we would take food to them there so you can see ongoing that there is a need a great need for people in our city we need to we need to reach out and not to be scared to reach out yeah yeah and um some of the sad things we've had in our program is we had one suicide so we've only had one in 12 years, so we thank God for that. But things like that can rip your heart out. Good job, Aspen. You're still in. <laughs> I remember hearing... Uh, quote that someone said it feels like when I'm doing my job I'm holding a I'm holding a lighter to an iceberg and then I just remember God saying to me like every drip from that iceberg is a refreshing drink to the soul for someone and uh you know I think the most hope that I find in doing what we do is like I just genuinely love the kids we work with because of the way I've seen this program move and grow in the last 12 years, I can say that with confidence that there's so many kids that we're gonna know their personality in such a great way nine months from now. And I see a lot of hope in that because we're getting some of these kids at like 10 and 11 years old. And I feel like at 10 and 11 years old, we have a chance of changing their lives. And even if we're sending them back to an unsafe environment, they're gonna have us every week. They're gonna know that we're gonna be there every week. I think the biggest hope and the biggest joy in my job is just seeing these guys grow up because I actually have grown to genuinely love these kids. Um, love showing up and seeing these guys every week. Um, don't love dealing with all the stuff that they make me deal with, but it's part of dealing with them and I like them enough to deal with it. And then towards the end of this conversation, he got a call and it was not a good call. It was a reason to pray. And so we had an opportunity to pray together. Um, this was really profound. And uh, I keep praying for this, this guy, this young guy in a relationship, but I think that uh, that's just one way that God moves. And even, even in these circumstances, it's confusing. It seems like everything's going wrong. And yet if we're patient and if we believe and if we're steadfast and we're obedient to what God is calling us to, things like this happen. Now, you could think this was a small moment but I found it to be profound and, uh, and glorious. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's just one small relational way where God's been moving. Yeah, it was wild. During this season, there were, there were kids that I hadn't seen for a long time who I uh, used to either mentor or they're part of programs, things like that. But the pandemic kind of hit them in a, in a new, real way. And they were face to face with a lot of stuff, a lot of challenges addictions, um, a lot of kind of the consequences of, of choices that they had been making. And in the midst of all that chaos, they were, um, I guess, looking for, for someone, looking for so, a safe place. And I'm so glad that they, that they thought of me as, as a safe person. And so I, I received a lot of different texts and phone calls from, from these young men that I haven't seen for like 10 years, some of them the opportunity to like to meet with them and to sit and to talk about life and and to cry together and to um to pray together it was it was very unexpected and i think that the pandemic had a lot to do with with that just the isolation um the way it forced us to deal with a lot of things i've seen hope rise through this pandemic in multiple ways. For one, God keeps finding a way for us to do this, to hang out and to do ministry, and, um, and it hasn't stopped. And so although things are difficult and strange and precarious, uh, God keeps finding a way, and we still get to do things like this. 
and love each other and befriend each other. And I think, for at least for Antioch, the foundation's really been growing. My, my relationships with these guys have has grown exponentially throughout the summer. Um, and it gives us an interesting sort of uh, thing to talk about. The pandemic's been hard for everybody. So we have this baseline sort of discussion about what it's been emotionally to deal with this. And we're all on the same page, whether you're 35 or 13, we kind of all can talk about this in a, in a way. And so it's good, uh, it kind of connects us, which is an odd way to look at it, but uh, there is that. So the foundation keeps growing. Um, you, you gotta be creative, you gotta be courageous, um, but uh, God has no intention of not meeting the lost right now. And he's all intention of bringing hope to these kids and love to these kids, so there is gonna be a way. I've seen God moving in just in, in the way that he provides for the smaller details. Um, you know, it was basically like once insurance came through and once a lot of the restrictions for COVID were lifted, it's like he basically unrolled this carpet and all the things that we had been praying for for the last year were suddenly coming to fruition. He, I had volunteers contacting me I have asked very few people to volunteer. They've all come to me, and they all have different gifts and strengths, and so we've been able to put together a really good team. Okay, I'm letting, uh, letting steel go. Okay, we don't really need them. Why do you enjoy working with horses? Um, they're just like a big, teddy bear that you can come to. They don't judge you about anything and they're just really fun animals to be around. Yeah, they don't judge you by your appearance. They don't yes. care. <laughs> um, I got connected to Stable Haven by... Maxine's been a friend of my mom's and they have a riding club together and I was just asked if I wanted to help out with this and I did. And. I've been doing it for kind of around a year-ish, setting up and everything and getting the horses ready. And then just, I worried, will anybody even want to come to this? You know, I haven't advertised really, or, or is, this some, is this really something that people want? And again, I just would get random calls or texts and um, she would sort of just would travel by word of mouth. And yeah, I was quite busy this summer. So it's been really, really neat to see how it's not people that I've manufactured to come or I've asked to come. It's, I just prayed that God would bring the people that he wanted to be here, and that is what he's done. And then amongst this, this season of just uncertainties, that like flicker of hope through starting Recreate, for me, has just given me lots of life. And being able to see students actually create and, and make something themselves and, and be so proud of it. I, I just, yeah, hope, hope is totally just rising in the, in the moment. I enjoy coming to Recreate because it's just somewhere I can be like, creative and see my friends and like, people I don't normally get to see during the week. Um, yeah, it's just a way I can fellowship with people um, while doing something I like. Like, I paint at home all the time, and so it's just doing something I enjoy with the people I enjoy, and yeah, so it's really fun for me. My favorite part about volunteering is, yeah, the, the youth that come and getting to meet them and hear about their lives and learn more about them and just the connection that, it, that YFC and Recreate bring to people and the community as a whole. Yeah, yeah I see these students that, that have been so sad during COVID just having these moments of, of happiness while they create. And sometimes it's frustrating when you're creating things because it's not turning out the way that you want it to. You're kind of looking at it being like, well, this isn't how I expected it. But honestly, that beautiful things come from a journey. Beautiful things come from that journey of life. And, and so... Yeah, that's a huge way I've been experiencing hope is through the provision of, of people that are 
partnering with the dream that I have to expand this program and to make it more accessible to more youth so that more people can come and experience hope. I think it's hard to be able to notice the ways that God's been working in the people um, connected with my ministry, just in the sense that uh, we haven't really had many young women that we've been connected with. Um, I think it seems like every few weeks I hear about another young mom that's out there and needs support, and uh, it's great to finally have some specific names and specific faces that we're praying for. It's super exciting. It's a lot of fun. It's, yeah, it's just, I feel like it's something that we've been praying for this whole last year is just for young moms to come and find a place to be together. And so I've really enjoyed this whole evening. It's been really fun and and it's a privilege to be able to show young moms how to cook meals that will help them raise their families. And yeah. We really believe that the young moms are going to come. Uh, we just have to keep the hope alive, keep trusting in the Lord that this ministry is his plan, that he is going to bring the young moms that that need hope, that need support, that need care, that need to feel like they belong somewhere. And yeah, we're not going to give up and one day there will be a harvest. We've seen God move in, in a number of different ways and a lot of them are just with the kids and their relationship with uh, a God, the Father, because they don't, some of them don't have uh, fathers in their home, and it's difficult for them to understand a loving God. And it's, um, so some of them have, have, uh, have a partnership with Carpenter's Church a couple blocks down, and we've had some of the kids go into the Sunday school, some go into the youth program, and families going to church. Uh, a few years ago, we had some amazing um, spiritual things happen with a few kids getting baptized and and just even catching up with some of the students that have either graduated from your programs. It just uh, amazing some of the choices that they have made. Yes, yeah, some have have made the best choices, but others have certainly gone on to do do things that uh, you probably didn't expect if you first met them. You got to have the hope and you got to have the uh, strength and and pray with God's help that you can get, get this um, get this situation handled and dealt with. What is your favorite part about summer programming? Uh, I like how we gather together and that we like follow Jesus and like hang out with each other and build relationships. And yeah, I really like that. I have definitely wanted to give up in ministry probably numerous times. For the longest time, the kids just weren't coming and um, yeah, it was hard to get together with my volunteers and other staff every week at Stepping Stones and not have anybody, any students there was very challenging and very discouraging. Uh, yes, I've wanted to give up on several occasions. I uh, have a feeling sometimes I'm getting too old for this. When the programs that you have been pouring your heart and soul into for the last 20 years, when, when those things suddenly come to an end, and there's no guarantee that they're going to start up again. And it's just over. And it makes you stop and think. And I had to come to terms with that. And I had to ask a lot of, a lot of questions. 
about where I find my value, where I find my meaning. Um, am I still valuable when all the, the programs that I run are, are no longer going? Like, do I still have something to offer? But then through that season, I began to understand that, that my value is not in what I do in the programs that I run. My value comes from being loved by Jesus and how that is what has to propel me. And, and that's the message we're trying to send to these kids. And, and as I look deeper, there was so many opportunities that are, that are out there. And when I think about the opportunities there are, it's, it can be overwhelming because there's, there's just so much to do. One of the big things that I've been learning is that I really can't do this journey alone. And that's why it's so important to remember that, that we have to invite people into this thing, to walk with us. Um, we have to invite people into this, into this beautiful story of bringing hope to hurting kids. We have to invite people to journey with us. Not just the people that are there in your life, but those people that will walk through the mud with you, that they'll like, help you and drag you through the crap and take you through those moments that are hard. And uh, yeah, like that's what Christ did for us. You know, took that cross and he bore that pain. And uh, yeah, people can do that here too with us. We're not alone. And uh, Christ was the ultimate example of that sacrifice and we need to be living more like him. And so that's a lot of what I've been learning. There's a glimmer of hope when I see, listen to the laughter, like at different events that we're at and different programs we're running and the laughter of the kids and kids talking to you and everything of that nature. Then it just gives you the strength to move on. I think one of the, one of the best things in youth ministry is when you are able to like work together with, with your ministry partners, camps, other youth groups, and to put on big events and just to pack a room full of kids and just to play together and to worship together. And those things are incredible moments. And you know, we've been missing those things for a long time. Um, so it was really cool at the end of summer to be able to be together again like that. The Connection is a ministry partnership between Grove Youth, Lakeview Youth, Camp Kadish, Redbury Bible Camp, and Saskatoon Youth for Christ. Um, it's just been a time where we get to just play games, um, hear some teaching, hear what's going on in different ministries, and just have a place for students to get connected to a youth program or a community, um, especially camp kids who come back into the city and don't know where to connect for their faith. Um, so it's a place for people to just get connected to a youth group, make some friends, meet some leaders, um, and just have a really good time growing in their relationship with God. So when ministries like Youth for Christ can connect to a kid, maybe it's a kid that doesn't really, isn't sure about church, but it's sort of in that, hey, I want to connect to people who talk about Jesus, do things, uh, YFC is great. And so an event like The Connection is just a place where we can connect kids that have come during the summer, and they can come, and they can meet their friends, they can see staff, and hopefully we can make that connection back to somebody in the city, YFC, or one of the other churches like Grove or Lakeview, and make sure that they find their place here in the city after camp. At camp, we brought out a bunch of YFC guys. Um, the, and I remember the one, the one night around the, around the campfire, our speaker had just finished and he gave this opportunity for guys to uh, pray and accept Christ. And we had four of our, four of the guys just from YFC that night gave their lives over along with a handful of other kids from, the, from that one cabin. Um, like, how amazing is that, right? This, despite everything in the world, right? These kids placing their hope, their trust in Christ. Put out your hand, and for some of you, you do the thing where you're like, I'm going to 
I dedicate my life to Jesus. I know that all this year, all I did was sit at home and watch Netflix, and I lived nothing for Jesus, and I acted nothing like Jesus when I was around my friends. But this is the year. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Galatians 6, 9 talks about uh, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Hope is just, see, sometimes the only thing we have to cling on to is hope. Hope is rising. Hope is rising. Hope to me is uh, inspiration. It's a guide. It's help. It's, uh, it's something that can unite us and uh, draw us into something that is way, way, way bigger than ourselves. Hope is coming. I think our place is just to love people, um, to accept them, to help them belong, for them to feel valued, um, that they have a place that they can be safe every week, that we can provide that for them. Hope is rising up. Hope is coming. I see the light breaking through. Hope, to me, is not being alone. Hope is knowing that even in the dark times, there's a bigger picture. There's God looking down on us as if it was a parade, and he sees the whole picture, and he sees that these dark times are just a tiny, tiny spot on the line, and there is just a way bigger picture than sometimes we can see in the moment, and we're not alone, and there's hope because God is with us, and we're gonna reap a harvest.